going to share about my journey and why I've decided to pursue a career in public service. And thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nagesh Rao, and as Winston said, I work for the U.S. Small Business Administration as the Director of Business Technology Solutions. Uh, before that, I the two and a half billion dollar uh, seed fund, America Seed Fund, the SBIR program. Uh, in addition to all those kind of efforts, I've been in the private sector, I've worked in venture capital and startups and entrepreneurship, practiced patent law, well, as a research scientist, I've, I've kind of gone all over the gambit. And so it's interesting when Winston uh, reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing this panel on, you know, alternative career paths of the sort for, for in the Asian American community. I was like, ah, perfect. I've, uh, I've led that life um, as, as, a, as an Indian in a ABCD. I know for many of you, you're ABCs, right? So um, the American born confused Desi, as the, the Indians would say to me, I was supposed to become a doctor, um, a medical doctor. Did not happen, of course. Uh, my sister ended up becoming the doctor, so my dad is, she's the favorite child of the family now. Um, which is fine. Uh, we've all done well. I think what's been interesting was I chose a path in jumping around, as, a, as my friend said, a nomadic career path. And it, it served me well, but it's not for everyone. It's not for the faint. And I think what's most important here for this dialogue is to talk about redefining success. What does a successful path go, look going forward? And Winston and I know each other through the Eisenhower Fellowships. We're both Eisenhower Fellows. And I actually, I think, I don't know about you, Winston, probably you got that validation from your parents when you became a fellow like I did, uh, that finally you, you succeeded in something. This is what my parents said. Oh, great. He finally became, well, they were like, they were like I, Eisenhower, what? And then, and, then, and then my dad saw the picture of me getting to shake hands with General Powell. And he said, oh, okay, all right. I don't know what this is, but you got a picture with General Powell. Okay, you succeeded, you know? So I, I, I think this will be a, a fun, lively conversation ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, I'm Joe Carvalho. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in Hawaii. Uh, I'm old enough that I was born uh, in the territory of Hawaii. Uh, and so my birth certificate says territory of Hawaii. Uh, but you're just going to have to trust me on that because those of us from Hawaii don't like to show our birth certificates uh, and uh, to, to prove that to you all. Um, I am half Chinese and half Puerto Rican. Uh, my mother is uh, the Chinese, uh, Pang is her surname. I'm a third generation uh, Chinese. Uh, the Chinese, Puerto Rican, Spanish mix, uh, I kind of feel like I'm a test tube Filipino. Um, but what was interesting for me is uh, uh, that might be uh, different from your all's experiences. Being, uh, being Chinese, uh, I was actually part of the majority growing up in Hawaii. So I have a different perspective uh, growing up. I never felt like I was in a minority. And by the time I went off to uh, school in, uh, in Spokane, Washington, uh, that was never an issue. Uh, what was an issue is I grew up in a blue collar family, uh, a strong educational uh, background that my folks uh, committed to that. Uh, my father uh, you know, knew that I liked math, so he said I should be an accountant. Um, and it wasn't until someone in school said, you know, you can be anything you want to be. I knew I wanted to uh, serve people. Uh, I grew up Catholic. I remember telling the priest at some point I'd like to go to the cemetery and he says I'm pretty sure you'll end up there at some point. <laughs> and uh, 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 so as a, with this service gene I thought well why don't I be a doctor. So I, wanted, so I went off to school, couldn't afford school, and then I did ROTC to pay for school. In a second I fell in love with the Army. 38 years later uh, I retired from the Army. Uh, had spent a lot of time with infantry type units, uh, went to ranger school, went to special forces school, did a number of uh, uh, deployments. Uh, clinically, uh, I ended up going to medical school and I ended up as an internist, nuclear medicine doc and cardiologist. Uh, but w ultimately what uh, kept me in the military uh, is the idea of the young men and women who are serving our nation and defending democracy uh, uh, far and away. Um, and so, even after I've left, uh, I've joined a not-for-profit that is 
whose sole mission is to advance military medicine, and that's why I'm at uh, Henry Jackson now. Look forward to taking any questions you guys have uh, down the road. Thank you. Thank you all. So I think the best place to start is to sort of understand what our own definitions of success are, right? Before we even get into what redefining it is. So I, I would start with actually Nagesh, and then we'll go to Tiffany. What is your definition of success? Give me a one minute, one sentence or two sentence. If you're content with your life, that's success. So my definition of success would be doing what sets your soul on fire. Doing what truly makes you feel alive. This certainly can be expanded, but my one sentence is sustained happiness. Kind of rolls all of this uh, together. Wonderful. So um, early years, and I think those are formative, especially growing up Asian American, right? Uh, Tiffany, maybe you can kind of start. You're in this advocacy policy kind of uh, government service area. We don't really push that as a Chinese American community. When you were growing up, you know, was that an option? Was it not an option? Like, give us the context around how you kind of found yourself gravitating there. So, as I shared earlier, I had, um, I had, I've had, I've lived, even though it's less than three decades, a very interesting life. Um, my mother is a survivor of domestic violence, and when I was six months old. Um, she left my father. Um, he was, he had, they had both come to the United States to pursue graduate degrees, but she had forfeited her opportunity to pursue a master's, um, to work at a Chinese buffet to put my father through, um, through two master's degrees. Um, and they ended up relocating to Pennsylvania, to Pittsburgh, where my dad got a great like technology consulting job in the, in the eighties. Um, and throughout this whole time, right, on paper, on the resume, you know, the family looked great, right? A father, I mean, a husband, two master's degrees, highly educated, a, a, loving, a loving wife, um, educated in Taiwan, created her first computer company at the age of like 24, um, then migrated to the United States to support her husband. But in the home, it was rife with domestic violence. Um, and at one point um, in the summer of 1988, my father actually, um, he threw my mom out of their home in Pittsburgh and she was homeless for the whole summer. She taught, when she talks about the story, she talks about all of the, if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, there's a lot of cobblestones in downtown Pittsburgh. And when she tells the story, she says that every cobblestone has been touched by her tears. She would sleep on park benches during the day and walk the streets of Pittsburgh at night. And she ultimately found herself in a homeless shelter for women. And it was there, they cooked a lot of spaghetti because spaghetti is like an easy and inexpensive food to make. And she would get very nauseous. And one of the staff workers said, you know, Lily, like maybe you should take a pregnancy test. And she was like, there's no way I can be pregnant. I've been homeless for three months. There's no way a child, uh -oh. a child could have survived under these conditions. And, um, and so she did take a pregnancy test and that is the very beginning of my story. Um, I was homeless even before I was born. <laughs> and so, you know, that growing up under those conditions, like my mother was brave enough as a H4 visa holder, right, on my dad's H1B, she just applied for her legal permanent residency. Um, and she, at six months old, the way she tells the story is she was watching um, the Tiananmen Square massacre on TV, right, in June of 1989, holding me in her arms. And she saw these students being mowed down by the tanks. And she said that she saw them fighting for their lives, for freedom, for democracy. And she said if they could do that, she could have the strength to leave. And so she left my father. Um, and because of that, because she didn't have all the master's degree, she didn't have the education that he had, he had the job. Um, 
we en- I ended up growing up in poverty. So I grew up on every form of public assistance you can imagine, Section 8 housing, um, food stamps, um, you know, and, and so that kind of, that story and that, that legacy of my mother's strength and her perseverance in the face of incredible odds, right? Not only just the um, logistical odds of, of financial, having the wherewithal to raise a child when, when she was the only one in this country from her family, all of our family is still back in Taiwan, but also the strength of, you know, going against an entire, you know, 2,000 year plus history of what a woman's role is and, and what is proper, what are the traditional gender roles for Chinese women and having the strength in the late 80s to leave my father. And it's because the work that I do today is to honor her sacrifice. Um, and that's really what fuels my advocacy and the work that I do for Governor Wolf. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Um, thank you, Tiffany. The Nargesh, um, you're Indian American, obviously, uh, and there are a lot of similarities between Indian American and Chinese American <coughs> communities here. Uh, I would say, you know, because a lot of times we like to compare ourselves to other groups, the Indian Americans seem to be doing slightly better in some of the areas. But, you know, give us some context. What, you know, you have a lot of, obviously, Asian American friends as well. Give us some context around what was similar or what was different, you know, what was positive you know, uh, and maybe what was negative as far as growing up Asian American, but specifically Indian American. Yeah, no, thank you. And Tiffany, wow, uh, excellent remarks to, wow. Um, I don't know how I can follow that. Um, you know, it's interesting for the Asian American population, I was, Joseph and I were talking a little bit about this earlier. It's fascinating. When, when I heard about this conference from Winston, I, I said, ah, yes, I've been to plenty of those from the Indian community as well. And in fact, it, it breaks down even f- uh, a, a ton more in the Indian community. The, the Gujaratis have their own group. The Andras have their own group. The Andras within Andras have their own group. Uh, I've been to these types of conventions for like 30 plus years now, uh, just with my parents and have grown up on it. I mean, there's even the Api, which is not the Asian American Pacific Islanders, but Asian Americans, uh, Asian American physicians of Indian origin, which is its own separate group. And my dad was part of that group. So it, it to, you know, to, to answer your question once that I think what's unique in the Asian American identity here in America is, is that it is quite diverse, right? It's very diverse and each community has forged its own path forward. I think when I look at how my parents came to America um, and where they came from, you know, it was very meritocracy driven to get here. I think in the same case for Tiffany's parents, when they came here, they came here under, you know, a little bit of a distressed situation to come in and, and grow economically and prosperity. And what has happened as a result of the, the new immigrants coming to America, they're redefining success, but it also creates this cultural chasm as to what success is going back to that, that initial question. And for what my parents saw success was, you either became a medical doctor, you either became an entrepreneur and started your own company, or you became a uh, engineer slash professor, right? That, that, and there, it was a hierarchical system of success. And I think that was true in most of the Asian American cultures, whether it was Korean, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Filipino. When you came to this country, the expectation was is that you would achieve a level and, and go try to go above that and then your next generation would spawn and go even higher than that. So it, it, it becomes an interesting situation as to how um, the next generation, as they, they grow up in a confluence of at home, you're Indian, but outside of the house, you're American. And at home, we ate Indian food, but outside of the house, we had American food. And I went to a military um, high school, so that was even at, at another layer of complexity there because I, you know, I'm being introduced to this regimen of, of military protocol and it, it, it creates a very unique blend, but I think it's because of that that you come across stronger and more, um, one can become more stronger and more attuned, mindful of the cultural world around us. I think for Indian Americans in particular, you know, 
it, I don't know if we necessarily are prospering. Uh, the prosperity level is uh, better. I think it's just different. I, I also think it, it it varies across the board. I mean, I have seen, I know of Indians who who've come in here, come to America, and you know, operate the Seven Elevens and the gas stations. And I know of those who become the physicians. But but it's what what the core DNA that I've seen in the Asian American ethos is tenacity. It's hard work and tenacity. That that that's the common thread I've always seen across the board in the Asian American community, is that there's tenacity and there's hard work, and there is this. There is a hierarchy, but it's a hierarchy based on meritocracy almost. Like you have to earn it. You can't just be given to it. it and when it's hand given, there is definitely. I I, I don't know. I, I I'm I'm gonna be safe to say you. It's probably the same in most of the Asian American communities. Definitely in the Indian community, if something's hand given to you without earning it, it's kind of looked with a little bit of derision, right? You you had to have earned it. You had to have um, fought hard and and attained that that capability to earn it. And so I, I I think that's been a common thread all across the board is is like hard work and tenacity. But what happens is um, is what is the end metric and what is the end result? And it's tough for immigrant parents when they come here to America because, you know, for my parents for a long time, the only thing that they understood success was was medicine, becoming a medical doctor or becoming a professor. So it, it, it's becoming upon us to actually redefine that success a little bit and show, look, you can still be prosperous by doing different things and, and, and going forward. But it, it's, a, it's, it's a unique world. Yeah. And it's still, it's still being written today. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I, I like that you mentioned this kind of hierarchy because I think many people here run into that Confucianism that's sort of built into our culture, right? And and while I'd love to ask Joe about being in the army, especially since that a lot of times is sort of the lowest point on that on that hierarchy. Um, really, Joe, for you, the context of growing up. You grew up in Hawaii. You grew up with a majority of Asians being the norm. And we talk about a pluralistic society. We talk about the future. And while we may never be a majority per se, I think the mindset would like to be in the, in the way that we think like you have all those options. Could you kind of provide that context growing up? So um, uh, when we, uh, in Hawaii, um, I didn't realize it's it's it was small talk in Hawaii to, to ask uh, to ask someone what their nationality was, and you got very good as I'm sure you are to say that person's Chinese or that person's Japanese or Korean uh, or Portuguese or uh, the catch-all was Howley. So we never dis distinguish Irish from French or whatever. They're Howley, uh, just uh, uh, white uh, white folks. Uh, and I was so I was never I was actually when I was bullied is because I was uh, dark from my Puerto Rican side, uh, not because I was Chinese. Um, uh, and in fact, if uh, what I tell people now is if if you if if you're Caucasian and you and you go to Hawaii even now, and, and you want to feel what it feels like to be a minority, go to Hawaii because you are definitely. Uh, you don't sound the same. You don't look the same. It's very. Uh, uh, it can be very distressing and maybe eye-opening uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, as I mentioned b before, my uh, very blue collar. My father was a policeman, and my mother um, stayed at home. Uh, she had been married before. Had two children. Second marriage. She had uh, married a, a Filipino gentleman initially, and my father, Puerto Rican, as dark as I am. So uh, even uh, in Hawaii, that was an unusual thing to see a, a Chinese uh, uh, a gal marry someone who wasn't Chinese. Uh, uh, so uh, she was breaking barriers uh, from the from the get-go um, in that regard. But uh, they. So she stayed at home for a while, and then she was what uh, we called at the time a uh, waitress. Uh, and then she was a maid. I know there are new terms uh, that we use now, but that's what we knew it as without it being pejorative. Uh, and she'd bring home the change uh, every day that she made from uh, tips, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I didn't realize how hard she worked or how hard my dad worked or how much they sacrificed for us to um, go to school. But uh, 
They put us all through uh, private school, which in, in our case just happened to be a Catholic school going, going through. And that was, that was the, uh, uh, the commitment. And my mother would always talk about how she was teased by her family's cousins, etc., on uh, wearing the same clothes, not having new shoes, um, and uh, that she was silly to, to not just let us go to public school and then have more things for herself. So in retrospect, a, a, a strong sense of delayed gratification on my mother's part, uh, uh, really for her life, so that her kids could have uh, uh, this foundation. And um, it didn't take long for, um, for me to realize that at least maybe every adolescent does this, but I felt like I had a greater sense of where to go, uh, what to do, than my parents could help me with. Um, and I know I was wrong, but that was, that was my sense, that my father couldn't tell me anymore what math class to take uh, or what, what to do. So their encouragement was simply st study hard. We're working hard. Your job is to study hard. And so when we would complain, how come our friends get to play after school? No, your job is to study. Uh, uh, and we got through that. So inculcated in us is a sense of uh, authority, discipline, uh, and strong foundational uh, base. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I didn't, and, and I, uh, I don't know if you know, but the, uh, Catholicism, very disciplined as well, right? Everybody stand up at the same time, sit down, same time, well, you know, every very orderly. And uh, so when I went to, and I worked at the uh, pineapple cannery as well uh, uh, growing up, and, um, and uh, saved every penny, uh, I tell folks that I, I was a guy that touched every pineapple and made it go into the machine that cored it, so that when you when you have a nice nice round pineapple, some dude is is pushing it through the machine. So every day I would I would be touching forty thousand, eighty thousand pineapples, and I would do this seven days a week and all summer long, saved every penny, and that was only twelve hundred dollars. I, I I told you I was old old guy, uh, so I went. Luckily, my father and mom let me go to college. I show up there, I realize I can only pay room and board for one semester with that. And that's how, um, that, uh, it's kind of like God gave me the chance to say, oh, well, you can do work study, you can work in cafeteria, all this. And I thought, well, then I won't be able to study because I'm trying to go to medical school. I didn't even know what that meant, by the way. I didn't know what you call the thing in the back of your throat. I didn't know what erythromycin was. I didn't know, all I wanted to do is help people. And so then, uh, then I, uh, saw ROTC and they said, well, this is how we stand, it's how we salute. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm at peace with this, right? Someone's telling me what to do. There's a right and wrong, one plus one always equals two. Uh, so I ended up being a math major. Everything is very stand, standards-based for me, very structured. Uh, and so I switched in college from wanting to be a military officer and ho hoping I'd become a physician. It was a flip. I fell in love with the military. And what the military taught me on this base of uh, uh, disciplined thought and respect for authority uh, and tenacity, as was mentioned before, is uh, the sense of leadership. Uh, and I, I think even as a young person, I always thought that I felt like I could lead. And luckily for me, uh, society didn't tell me that I couldn't lead. So I just, right, I never looked back at myself, right? I just looked out of my eyes, and I just, I was just a dude, right? I was just a, a regular guy. Um, and I never dawned on me that I was, that I was different. Uh, the other thing that I think was helpful growing up is my folks didn't let us speak pidgin English. So I'm third generation on both sides. If you read Michener's book, Hawaii, the Puerto Ricans, the Portuguese, the Chinese, the Japanese, everyone came over to help in the plantation field make some money, go back home. Well, no one ever went back home. And that's and in order for the plantation owners and the workers to be able to communicate, you created Pigeon English. So it's, it's a mixture of many, many languages, uh, a, a very slurring of, of English. So our, our folks wouldn't let us speak that because we had to speak proper English. Uh, so I was uh, may, maybe at, a, at an advantage uh, in, in that regard. Um, and I got to tell you, the military is, as far as I was concerned, a meritocracy. Um, although I did apply and say I was Chinese, I always had to think: Do I is it do I say I'm Chinese or do I say I'm Puerto Rican? But at the end of the day, I feel like I can go toe to toe with anybody. But why wouldn't I say I'm Chinese <laughs> or Puerto Rican? And and 
and I fell in love with the infantry, fell in love with the things that were uh, uh, the, inf the, the military is interested in, and uh, had opportunity to lead, and, and, I, and I led. When I was a general officer, someone asked me to join the Pan Pacific Asian uh, American Leader Mentor Program, a, a mentoring group. And I said, why would I join that group? I don't look at a young officer and say, you're Asian, so I'll help you, and you're not Asian, so I won't help you. I help everybody. And they, they, they told me, um, you may not look down, but I guarantee people look up. And, and, and once I, like, ah, therefore I must embrace the role of being a role model to allow someone to say, wow, I, that, that guy kind of looks like me, maybe there's a chance. So I, you know, I may have lucked into it, it may have been the Hawaii thing that helped me out, uh, but I want to make sure that everyone in this country has, a, has that opportunity. And my mother is, has just been so encouraging. Even when I was a general officer, she would still say, I hope you make it someday, right? Uh, she would, she'd send me money on my birthday, right? Uh, until the day she died. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I owe everything to my mother and to probably to her Chinese spirit of, of creating uh, what she thought was gonna be a good contributing citizen to this uh, country. Let me just stop there. Thanks, Winston. No, thank you. That's that's an amazing story. Thank you very much. Um, well, let's move into sort of more of the professional realm. Tiffany, I think you are actually in a very unique position where you get to engage with the gamut of the Asian Americans in Pennsylvania, but you get to see sort of all walks of life. How have you, you know, I guess, what have you seen? What what are we pushing? What are we, you know, maybe not pushing where we should be? And like, how did you synthesize that? So really quickly, I want to share just some baselines for, for what I'm about to share with all of you. So the model minority myth, which is what Winston was alluding to in his, in, in his opening remarks, the model minority myth was a term that was actually coined by a sociologist and published in the New York Times in 1966. And it was created to describe the success that Japanese Americans had experienced after being incarcerated in World War II. So it was coined to say, well, look at this persecuted, oppressed minority community. Look how successful they've become why can't other minority communities be like this community? So I just want to share that with you because I think that's really, really critically important because in 1960, we, so since 1966, right, and the passage of the 1965 um, Immigration Nat Na Nationality Act by President Johnson, that is why most of us have been able to come to the United States, except for those Asian Americans that have been here, you know, five and six generations. I think that's critically important. Additionally, the passage of the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act would not have been possible without the Civil Rights Movement, right? That was the only reason we got to talk about a more equitable immigration reform was because the black community in the United States was pushing for equality, for rights, for, for the black community, which gave all of us greater rights and access. So with that being said, I wanna just quickly say, you know, those of us in the Chinese American community and then in the larger Asian American community, we owe an incredible debt to the black community and we need to remember that. So how that parlays to Pennsylvania is in Pennsylvania, we have an incredible diverse um, state. We have um, often what we call like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and then what's in between is the T. You might have heard it referred to as Pennsylvania. Um, so we have a very diverse, in the Asian American Pacific Islander community, a very diverse um, political affiliations, you know, we have we're largely Democrat, but we have very strong kind of Republican identified communities. Um, and we have a very diverse array of, of folks that have been in Pennsylvania or been in the United States for five and six generations in the Japanese American community, the Filipino community, the Chinese American community. Um, and then we have refugees that just stepped off the plane yesterday from like the Bhutanese community, from the Burmese community, 
um, and we have immigrants. We have a very large population of of Indian, Chinese, Pakistani, Indonesian. We have a large community of immigrants. In Pennsylvania, the growth of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community has really been attributed to immigration. So with that being said, what I've seen in the last five years is we have, um, and I think the one thing that has woven itself through all of the diverse Asian American Pacific Islander communities is this theme of tenacity and resiliency, right? Um, you know, but additionally, I see communities that are very well established. We, we have, you know, communities that have professionalized, that are doctors, scientists, lawyers, but I see a real disconnect between those communities and civic engagement. Um, in Pennsylvania, we just elected our second Asian American woman to the General Assembly. Um, we currently have one Asian American woman running for Congress um, in the 10th District. And in the Philadelphia City Council, we have two Korean Americans that are members of Philadelphia City's City Council. And we have one um, Korean American who's a mayor of the State College Borough. So Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we only represent about 4% of the entire state's population of around 13 million. So you guys can do the math. Um, so we're a very, still a very small subset, but what I'd like to see is more civic engagement. And I'm not even just talking about like running for elected office. I'm talking about registering to vote, um, voting, um, coming out for elections. People seem to think that elections happen every four years. They happen every six months. Every November, every May, there's a really important election that everybody should be voting in. And it's really, a lot of it is education. It's educating new immigrant communities about what the government, governmental system is in the United States at the local, at the state, at the federal level, and then also what the political system in the United States is. Because I think a lot of this disengagement is purely, I would say like 70% of it is ignorance, and I think 30% of it is fear. Because many of us come from countries where either we did not have access to democracy, or if you would ever say anything in opposition to the government, you could really be persecuted, not only like maybe people in your family might disappear in the middle of the night. So we're coming from these historical memories of a fear of government, of not the ability to actually be active participants in our government. And I think it's really incumbent upon all of us that are civically engaged in the, in the Chinese American community to educate all of our brothers and sisters about how to be actively engaged. And even if you're not a US citizen, you can still do voter registration, right? You don't have to be a US citizen to be an active participant in our democracy. If you're undocumented, you can still do voter registration drives. So I think you know, it's really important that, that we share that and we say that every one of us, every Chinese American in the United States has a role um, role in, in uplifting our community. Thanks, Tiffany. I, I think it's interesting thematically. We, we see Gary Locke yesterday just mobbed. I mean, they're like these popular celebrities when they show up here, but yet we have a cognitive dissonance where we don't really define it as success. Um, and, and I can see that changing, but I think it's a very interesting perspective to, to talk about just being politically active. Is, as a part of that. And then also leading to Nagesh, and then we're a little shorter on time, but keep it in two minutes. Um, you come from a private side. I know your network is just phenomenal there as well. You could easily jump over, um, and I have no doubt make a ton more money, right? But you chose to be a civil servant. You know, how, how is that with your identity of being Indian American, Asian American? How does that all come into like your definition of success? <clears throat> doing public service is um, is not f for those who are looking for an easy paycheck. It, it's for those who actually want to move the needle towards change for the better. Um, yeah, private sector is there, and maybe one day I'll I'll jump there. But I think. You know, in Joseph's case in military service, and Tiffany's case in public service, and even even myself, uh, we're looking we're looking beyond money. So remember, there there are probably four factors that you know get humans to do what they need to do to motivate, incentivize. That's love, pride, money, fear, right? 
And so when you go into public service, you're not doing it out of fear. You're not doing it for the money. You're, you're doing it more for the love and the pride. And, and from the pride perspective, it's not pride for yourself. It's pride for helping others and, and helping forge a new path forward, um, especially those who really do believe in ensuring an egalitarian society. That's, you, go, you go into public service because you're actually hoping to in initiate change for the better. You're hoping to help people see and and find the drive in themselves to go forward. Um, and so th I, I don't think there's anything more nobler of a cause than going into public services and actually, you know, dedicating your blood, sweat, tears for the betterment of society. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that's my answer there. One, one, one quick turnover there that, you know, I, I've been hearing this theme also of education. And that was one thing I wanted to highlight earlier. If you look at the Asian American population, you know, the one thing you probably heard all the time, all the time, all the time was education, 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 right? So my parents were were very frugal when it came to ah oh, this, you know, I want to you know go go to this uh, comic book store, I want to go, you know, check out a baseball game or, or or go to this park or whatnot. But when it came to education, the checkbook was open. Checkbook was open. It was like, oh, you want to go learn and new, develop new skill sets? Yeah, absolutely. We'll pay for it. And, and I think that's something else that's been a core identity uh, theme amongst the Asian American population is, is that education was considered very valuable. It's like if, if you have to spend your money besides on food and shelter and water, it's education. And I think that's been at the core of our DNA because we understood as a community that education can, can really lift you up. You can do anything you want as long as you make sure you got your, that education. So, yeah. you know, just side point. Good point. Um, I, I look at Joe and I'm thinking, I'm struggling with having a successful career and he's on successful career number two. So, you know, it, 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 sometimes it's, it's baffling and humbling in a lot of ways. But Joe, you talked about the Army, and, and I personally have a love for the Army also, because coming from being an Army guy. Um, but I know personally, I struggled with that identity in the Chinese American community, because many Chinese Americans didn't view being in the Army as <coughs> tangible, as, as even worthwhile. But you, you drive that theme of service, like you just wanted to help people. How has that shaped sort of your concept of being successful, being that you are helping people successfully in over two very you know successful careers. So, uh, so when I um, I told my mom that I was going to do ROTC um, to pay for school, and she said, "Oh, that would be good, but if you're going to do ROTC, do the Air Force because only dummies go in the Army." <laughs> uh, and uh, and and in the in Hawaii, there's all all the services are right there, but I. It was amazing how much you don't know about the military. And even since 9-11, since, since I, I, I would hazard to guess many, many Americans don't know about the military because they have put up uh, fences around them, security and everything. But it's not two populations. It, it, it's the same American citizenry uh, that has elected to sign this blank check payable to the United States of America for up to and including their very life to defend this nation. Not to defend a king or queen, or any individual or an administration, but to defend democracy. And, and it, it didn't, it, and the other thing I noticed is growing up, uh, remember I said, uh, what's your nationality? It wasn't until I went to college that I realized, wait, wait a minute, nationality is American. It's, we were really asking, what's your heritage? Uh, and so, and then, then it didn't come back again to play until I was in Iraq, sitting in the, the mess hall, and there's a pole on this side of me, an Italian, uh, and a, a Brit, and I notice of all the, all the Americans in our uniforms, it kind of dawned you that before it says Army, Navy, or Air Force, it says U.S. So I felt kind of felt like an Olympian, right? It's like, wow, I I'm part of America. It's a cool, cool feeling. Um, and so this, when I talked about sustained happiness, by the way, very quick uh, uh, thing, four things that can make you happy four levels. Some are fleeting, some are sustained. First one, physical possession, right? Nice watch, nice car. You get a nice car, you're very happy. We all agree, you're very happy until the next year model comes out. Oh, I want the next year model. So that's fleeting. So, and then your, 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 uh, per, your interpersonal relationships then, uh, I want to just marry the, the uh, 
trophy bride or the trophy husband, right? You start to pick people based on how good they look or how well they're dressed so that you can really uh, screw up relationships. Next level is um, winning a competition. So we tell our kids to win, but it's not win at all costs, so, right? So you're happy when you win until you want to win again, right? So before the guys leave the field, they're starting to say, repeat, repeat. Why does, how many gold medals does Michael Phelps need, right? Enough already, why aren't you happy? I gotta get it again, I gotta get the feeling. So sustain happiness, first level, is belonging to something bigger than yourself. And the army gave me that. It wasn't about me. I felt like I could really contribute as a cardiologist, as a, uh, the, the surgeon, the medical advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but I'm just a cog in the wheel. I'm, and I'm at peace with that because it's the bigger military I'm trying to help because I'm trying to help this country. So that, that's kind of a cool feeling. That can keep you happy. Then finally, the ultimate happiness, if you're religious, what do you, want your, what, what do you believe your God wants you to do? If you're not religious, what do you want your legacy to be? Probably the same thing, right? You probably don't want your legacy to be Al Capone or Adolf Hitler. It's be a nice guy, a nice gal. So if that drives you, then like Nagesh said, you're content. You're not too high with the highs, not too low with the lows. Uh, and that's where I, f I feel. I'm not, I could have made a lot more money. Cardiologists, right? They throw money at cardiologists. Um, but I, and it drove my wife crazy a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to be in the military. And it worked out really well. I get to influence, I, I'd like to think, hundreds of thousands of people to, um, uh, to, do a, to be better, more resilient, more survivable, more agile as they defend our nation. So that part's pretty cool. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, we generals talk to each other. And so uh, a lot of generals' sons go to West Point, uh, the admirals go to Annapolis or whatever. And um, I talked to one person. I said, oh, you're, are your kids in the, mil in the Army? No, and he, he, it was a great life lesson. He goes, I got to chase my dream. I want my kids to chase their dreams. So success isn't where you are, it's how you feel about what you're doing. Whether it's service or not service, whatever, you can still get a lot of money, you can still have nice possessions, you can still win, but as long as that doesn't define you, I think that's, that's the secret to success. Thanks. I think that's a great point too, especially in today's day and age when you know, someone can make a huge career and lots of money off of just being on YouTube. You know, it's, it's this different paradigm shift where success really is your values and what you're pursuing. Um, so we have a couple of minutes and I want to open it up to the audience. There's a microphone over here for questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, please come up to the microphone and you can ask your question. Actually, I really enjoyed having a comment. Oh, could you? Yeah, mostly because they're recording. So. First of all, I really want to make a comment that really appreciate the three speakers and also our um, moderator to bring this forward and also our chairman of UCA has you know, organized this panel because it's so critical at this today's age as Asian Americans become more successful, quote unquote. Probably in material, in um, a career, in many aspects. But at, on the other hand, we also recognize, in terms of the whole societal engagement and social political influence, we're probably really lacking behind. And so, as you know, we talked about the African Americans really made the societal push. The rest of us are all benefiting. But the question is, where, where we can go, and where our next generations wanting to achieve. So as many of you probably have thought about that, uh, the Asian Americans also suffer from the highest mental depression. <laughs> you know, the, the Chinese American children are having the highest suicidal rate. So I like to invite the panelists to think about where can we go from that aspect. So to answer your question, I don't know if everybody saw the article that came out after Crazy Rich Asians was released about the um, income stratification in the Asian American community. Um, the Asian American community is currently experiencing the greatest income um, polarization between like the haves and the have nots. And I think that's just really important to remember. Like we, we need to remind ourselves that this, this model minority myth is a social construction. 
It is an, a story that has been told about who we are. And yes, it does, um, it does apply to some communities, but not to all communities. And when we, when we subscribe to that narrative, um, that you know, it, there are communities being left behind. There are very uh, disadvantaged and um, marginalized, um, we're talking poverty, violence, um, within our community. So I just wanna share that. Like there, in the Chinese community, there are new arrived immigrant communities that we need to be looking after. Um, to your question around kind of mental health and behavioral health, I think it starts at home. It starts at home. It starts by, you know, parents in the Chinese American community talking about feelings, talking about what makes somebody happy, what makes somebody feel fulfilled, listening to their children, creating spaces where their children feel safe enough to share about maybe a traumatic experience that occurs, to feel safe enough to talk about being bullied in school. I think it starts with the parents. I, you know, and for immig Chinese immigrant parents, it's a huge paradigm shift, right? But it's necessary. Your kids should feel safe to talk to you about what is happening in their lives. Um, and you know, I know in, in the Chinese American community, we don't talk about counseling or therapy, but hey, guess what? I go to, th to a therapist. I go to a therapist, you know, once every two to three weeks, and when I'm having an incredibly stressful time in my life, I up it up, you know? It's part of self-care. It's part of taking care of yourself. Because if I'm not okay, mentally, physically, emotionally, I cannot serve my community. And I'm a one-woman show for 500,000 Pennsylvanians. So, like, I think it starts with the parents. You guys all you all here in the room, you need to make it okay for your families, for your children. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about the violence that occurs in our home. We need to talk about domestic violence. We need to talk about sexual assault. We need to talk about sexual harassment. It does, us, it does nobody any service to keep these issues silent. What we have is women in the Chinese American community that live their lives broken because they've never healed from all of this trauma. We have to start talking about these issues. Uh, so, a couple of things to, to add on. You know, it, it, it's funny, my niece is a senior in high school out in San Jose, San Francisco Bay Area, and it is a highly uh, uh, competitive environment. Just all the, the Asian community is big there, right? With South Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Vietnamese, and. And it's very funny because we've, we're actually going through this right now where even my parents are, you know, all of us were just, you know, we're giving our words of support because she's a senior, she's about to go to college, she's applying in, in such a very competitive environment. You know, the, the, the cream of the crop, you go to Stanford or you go to Berkeley or you go to UCLA and, and it, it's just highly competitive amongst the Asian community there. And, and, and it was, you know, funny too because when I, my niece was telling me about her academics and she's she's very smart very very talented i was like oh my god you could you could get into a lot of great schools out outside of california you can get into rice university probably rpi carnegie mellon all this stuff but there is this persistent dialogue in this in the in the bay area that no no, no you got to go to these schools and so i it, it goes back to tiffany's point is like the family's got to start having that conversation and i think all of us together talking and discussing it through whatever she wants to do and makes her happy that's what we want to support but at the same time it does involve that conversation to happen so i know my parents have actually you know they've they've matured enough uh, they've matured a lot to to the point of which where they they've they're engaging with her and saying hey don't stress out don't stress out it's you know life's going to be fine don't worry about it like just do the best you can you get to where you are and and, and remember it's just a milestone and many milestones ahead um so i i, I think that's very critical right at the bat it, it's it's at the home and it's with the family and it's also with the friends engaging on that front and and also just on a, on the other point of income stratification uh, gandhi said it best uh the world is enough for everyone's needs not everyone's greed so you know it, it's always been a philosophy for me and and uh, and and i know some of my friends you know to be philanthropic however possible so you know if, if you don't need it go ahead and give it away give it away to a good cause is that you know my two cents on that i think we have time for one more quick question if anyone has one uh, thank you 
Thank you guys so much. Your stories are really inspiring. Um, I'm a second generation Asian American. I'm currently in high school. And I was just wondering how you suggest um, I balance my passion and my logic. Because from a young age, it's been instilled in me this kind of fear to pursue anything outside of like doctor, lawyer, engineer. So um, I think there is a certain logic to that that my parents have. Um, I was wondering how you suggest I don't be naive about it, but still have the bravery to go and pursue what I love. Great question. Who wants to tackle that? Look, do I go first or? Well, number first thing is your parents love you, right? And and. Uh, so I'll just, I'll be your surrogate dad here for a second. Uh, I, I want you to be successful. What you're not hearing is my sense of success, I, it's locked in my head. Therefore, I only know three paths. So if you can convey to your mom and dad, you have made me a great woman. I'm gonna contribute to this country. Um, you've given me a great brain. You've inspired me to make good decisions. Uh, and I know you would be proud of the decisions I make. I will, I will maintain all the values you've given me, but I'm seeing some other things out there. I, let me surprise you with how I'm gonna be successful. The things they think about, the things I think about, because my son, by the way, my son's an artist. I was very nervous, right? How are you gonna pay, right? Uh, you know, I'm like worried about his insurance, right? And he's saying, uh, oh, don't worry, I'm, I'm all right. And it's like, oh, dude, we gotta pay your insurance now, your health insurance. First of all, it was uh, with the uh, 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 Affordable Care Act, right? You had to, and I said, dude, if you get sick, no one plans to get sick. If you get sick, we're not gonna say, see, I told you, now you have $300,000 bill, right? That's gonna be my $300,000 bill. So we got, we pay, so, um, and he surprised me, he turned a corner, but it took a lot from the parents to kind of hang on. And that's not a, that, that's a very, that's a fearful, sense so you have to tell them you you did right you inspired me to move out right i'm a young woman and i can be anything in this country watch me and and how i do that uh and it may right success success is not money success is is uh our, what's your legacy going to be and that's what i would focus on i totally concur with joseph's points um I actually went through that kind of situation too. So th this is how I solved it. I'm not saying this is what you do. Just this is what works for me though. Um, when I decided to drop out of the medical route in, in college, the pre-med program I was in, my dad was like, whoa, what What are you doing? And then he said, well, what are you gonna major instead? I said, oh, well, and I'm, I'm at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic, a very, very good science engineering school. I said, oh, I think I'm gonna get a degree in philosophy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Like, like, like Joe's reaction, he's like, what the hell? <laughs> like, he's like, what are you gonna ask? Like how much, would you like fries with that? It's like, his, is my dad's response. So he said, hey, you, you can study philosophy, go ahead, go ahead. But he was like, do a science or engineering, something, something just to, to cover your bases. So I ended up getting a dual major, right? BS in materials engineering and, uh, and a BS in philosophy. And, and it worked well because I got to satiate my, create, my creative mind and just the stuff I wanted to, to, to learn. But at the same time, it, it got my parents off my back a little bit. Now, to be honest with you, um, it worked out well at the end of the day because the materials engineering degree I still use to this day. I learned an awful lot from it. Um, am I a practicing materials engineer? No, not well, a little bit with the company I work with in Sri Lanka. But, but my point being is, uh, um, there, Joseph is completely correct. I think that's the, the answer. But I will just say, if, if you want a pragmatic solution that I used, that was one I, I did. And to this day, I, I still keep my creative mind going. So. So since I was 11 years old, I wanted, I read uh, Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson's book, Gifted Hands, and I wanted to be a pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, because that was the narrative of what I heard um, how Asian Americans could be successful. Um, I ended up not getting into my first choice college. I graduated top five from Milton Hershey School, but I didn't get into my top 
top school, which was the University of Pennsylvania, because my my SAT scores weren't very good. I'm not a very good standardized test taker. Um, and so I ended up getting a really generous scholarship to uh, Dickinson College, which was just 30 minutes away from, from my boarding school. And, um, and I, you know, it was like my, my sec, it was not even my second choice school. It was pretty down, down the list, but I ended up doing, um, doing really well there. However, my second semester there, my first year, I failed organic chemistry. I am not actually a very good math and science person, but I'd been able to get by in high school, um, but college was a whole different ball game. And it was the first time in my life that I'd ever failed at anything, because I had done really well, you know, elementary, middle, and high school. I was really at the top of my class. I was a Rotary Youth Exchange student, so I lived my whole junior year of high school in the Republic of Hungary. Um, and I was really like shocked after I failed organic chemistry. And that summer between my, um, my first year and my my sophomore year um, at Dickinson, I kind of had like uh, not even a quarter life crisis because I was 19 at the time. But like I was just like, oh my gosh! Like this, the story I've told myself in my head of what I sh who I should be, what I should do. I obviously can't do it because I don't have the the innate like skills, the gifts to pursue that career. Um, so what I ended up doing is I that summer I spent three months in in northeastern China in the Liaoning province. Um, and I just really fell in love with China. Um, I had never been to China before. My parents are immigrants from Taiwan. However, my grandparents are from mainland China, Beijing, Henan, Fujian. Um, and I just, I was like, I, I love traveling. I love learning about different cultures. I love different languages. Um, and at that time, I was taking Chinese language. So what I did was, when I went back to Dickinson in the fall, I took my first women's and gender studies class changed my life. It gave me a language for my mother and my my lived experiences. It gave me the academic vernacular to describe everything I'd, I'd lived through, everything we'd gone through in an academic way. I didn't realize there was a whole course of study dedicated to understanding systematic and, and oppression of, of women and living in a patriarchal, I didn't even know that this all existed and I was so good at it because give me a microphone or give me a pen and I, I can get an A. Um, and so what I did was <laughs> I created my own major. I pursued a self-developed major. I created my own major. I wrote my own curriculum. I got it approved by the college and it was called Global Feminism. So what I did was I studied women's relationships to their economies, their governments, and their societies in different cultural contexts around the world. And then I spent my junior year at Peking University studying Chinese language and culture. Um, and I got to travel, I backpacked through India, I backpacked through Southeast Asia. And you know, when you ask that question, I, I hear myself at your age, and, and also, can we give her a round of applause? Yes. I want to see more of this. I want to see young Chinese Americans standing up and asking these questions. But I'm going to challenge you because these are things that I'm asking myself because I'm 29. I'm still figuring out, you know, what do I want to do in my career after potentially the commission? So I think you should ask yourself, and everybody in the room, you should ask yourself these questions on a regular basis. What is it that you want in your life? What feeds your soul? And then what is it that you need? What is, it, what is it that you need? Because that's very different for each one of us based on our, our lived experiences and our own personal de desires. What do you want for your life and what do you need? And, and an exercise that I engage in, I try to engage in on a, on a consistent basis is I try to envision the kind of life that I want for myself and my family. My mother lives with my husband and I. We got married four years ago. My mom has lived with us for three and a half years. Um, it's been quite the adventure. Um, but what kind of life do you want for yourself 10 years from now, 15 years from now? And, and then work your way backwards. Um, you know, do you, do you want to live by water? Do you want, do you want to live in a city? Do you want to live in suburb? Like things like that, I, I seem minute, but your quality of life is so incredibly important. Um, and the other piece is like, like what are your actual gifts? Because sometimes our gifts do not align with what we think we should be doing. And it's, it's better to have that reality check younger than older. And the other thing is like, if you fail, in the Chinese American, in the Asian American community, 
we're very, very hard on ourselves when we fail. Like failure is not an option, but it's okay to fail. In America, that's how the greatest entrepreneurs built their companies. Milton Hershey, when he was creating the Hershey Chocolate Company, he failed nine times. Okay, I haven't failed that many times. <laughs> so I think I'm doing okay, but it's okay to fail because it's in that tension and in that discomfort where you learn about yourself, what you're capable of. So you know, have new experiences as a young person, do internships. You can do internships in high school. You can intern, you can shadow a congresswoman, you can shadow um, your local state representative, like pursue new opportunities. Um, you know, make yourself a business card, even as a high school student. Go on, um, you know, all of these great, you know, uh, online print companies. You can get like 500 business cards for $15. Vistaprint, free shipping. Like, do that. B, you have the opportunity as a, as a going into 11th grade to be who you really want to be. And, and talk to all of us, you know, and help us guide you. Uh, so can we give them all a round of applause, please? Thank you for having them. It's just been so much wisdom. And Dr. Zhang is going to say something. I just want to say uh, one word. Uh, of course, we have uh, such a wonderful panel. Uh, one thing I learned in America is uh, we're talking about it. What's a success, right? The uh, once I heard, I thought it very philosophical that doing what you love is freedom. Think about it. not everybody actually doing what they love, right? And loving what you do is happiness. And in life, you have you're lucky to get both, right? I think their example shows it doesn't matter which major, which place you go. Are you doing something that makes you happy? And in the end, we all have one life. In the end, the most important thing is we have to ask ourselves, have we realized our full potential, right? You, if you really, your answer is yes, we realize your own full potential, you have a successful life. And I think uh, this topic that you see when we plan this convention, we debate a lot and you know, say what are some, how do we engage young people? And this is a topic we decide, this is one way to engage young people because every Asian American children grow up in those environments, right? So you've been expected to achieve certain things. But as today's, our panel already show, there's so many different ways you can succeed. And that is America. And uh, thank you. That's my thank you. Thank you. Uh, another round of applause, please. Thank you very much for coming uh, and sharing your experiences. And, uh, and I think from a logistics standpoint, the next session is back in the main ballroom. Yes. Um, Helen, can you just stand up? Can you stand up? Stand up. We have a living legend in our midst. She was integral to the justice from the Asian American community for Vincent Chin's death in 1982. She is an incredible author, Asian American Dreams. If you haven't read her book, we have a living legend in the Asian American community. If you don't know her, you need to just go up and introduce yourself.